thank you. Good morning, everyone. Um, I hope that um, yesterday was not too uh, <coughs> too uh, stressful and all the, uh, and get here. But nevertheless, uh, the presentation I'm going to have today is around crazy AI, but uh, in, instead of just starting into the AI, I will actually take some background and uh, I'm also present from where I am and uh, what I'm working with briefly. So first of all, I assume that every one of you have been using AI. Yes. How many of you have implemented AI? Some of you. Software and hardware. Software. Oh, yes. So what I'm going to show you today is actually uh, the utilization of implementing AI in FPGAs also. Or we put it this way, we are accelerating AI, we, we are creating efficient structures inside flexible hardware. So it would be more efficient in the implementation. And I will also come into the reason why it's important to be efficient. So my name is Trick Matisse, and I've been placed in the Gothenburg office for AMD. Uh, the presentation I will be running is uh, mostly made from my colleagues uh, Michael Bott and uh, Thomas Poisson, and I will present them in the next step. So, before I'm starting the office in Gothenburg, we have a small office in Gothenburg, in Mandal, and they, that's also the home of uh, the soft and hard uh, microwaves. And the microwaves from last year is also now RISC V. So, RISC V, as most of you might also understand, uh, aware and understand, it is uh, not an open source processor, but it's not the specification processor. So the ISA is uh, open for everyone to utilize. Uh, the good thing, however, is that they, that enables us to use an open source software tools and framework. So that means that even though the hardware is um, customer specific or implementation specific, uh, the tool flow is totally open source, and we actually rely on that one because the quality of open source and the innovation of open source is normally faster. However, we need to have a certain kind of proven and uh, tested and uh, guaranteed platform also. So that's the reason why we are keeping the Microplace 5 version as uh, closed implementation because we need to test and verify for the customers that have demands on known and good quality and also known handler of potential uh, issues and errors. Uh, we also work with cash currency. Cash currency is very important in uh, multi-processor design of shared data to minimize the data transport also to save power consumption. I will come to that later on in the AI perspective. When it comes to <coughs> the, the team that have working on these specific sections I am going to present today, uh, it is uh, the team, the red team, that have implemented uh, this Finn and Revitas networks. And I will show you later on what they have done. But the presentation here is mainly uh, in, done and prepared by Thomas Croy, so it's actually the second to, to, the, to the left in the top, and Michaela in the seventh center. And they are fairly tight connected to the university and, uh, and the development board. So they are working quite a lot with open source because they would like to keep and maintain anything um, in an open environment so they can share things with the uh, different vendors, different uh, <coughs> users and also different universities and so on. Uh, and uh, all the tools that they have provided is actually open source and they provide it with GitHub. So, before starting with AI, I would like to step back uh, one or two steps and start 
what is actually here and how we start and where are we at the moment. So, we can talk about generations of AI. So, typically the generation we started with was the algorithmic generation. This, this picture is actually one of the first ones, if you, if you Google on it, and you will see that this uh, the McKinsey company have this uh, picture. I try to things to show this generation of AI. So typically, it started with emulating human behavior and human capability in algorithms. So that means that it was more or less pure software describing algorithm and handling the capability of human brains or knowledge, or capability of the same name. So typically the thing that was, it advanced over time from in the 1960s and so onwards, and actually the first breakthrough was when the high level chess computer actually was winning over the world champion of the chess masters. But that is just an example. Next generation here is actually when we are starting to use big data. So we needed to have something that sorted bigger data in an efficient way. Uh, typically, a uh, usage of that one could be, for example, MR screening, it could be web search and so on. Many of you might think that there's quite a lot of wood here uh, around the AI. And I would say, when it comes to web search and that one's web search, I would say that's a lot of wood. How do you make that efficient and fast and so on? And those algorithms were well, not really easy to understand, but they became very, very complex. And at that stage, they found out that this might not be the path forward. We need to improve in making things better. And in the research and the university and so on, they have been trying to emulate the actual structure of the human brain. So the synapses, the connectivity and so on, and their way of breaking down decisions in the brain. So then they started actually to emulate the behavior of the human brain. So that's the third generation here for deep learning. So we started making these uh, decision trees, uh, inputs that actually takes with weights and so on, that actually take these decisions and with some biases and also activation functions. More or less exactly how the human brain is working. And then we need that we accelerate this one with more and more and more and more together and with more layers and so on. And after one we actually came up with a structure those were pretty efficient and uh, pretty advanced. But to make things simple, it's just a transfer. It's just a, from a mathematical point of view. You take a number of inputs and you make the decisions based on those inputs to that was. You either have direct transfer in the selection, or you have an internal state, remember what you have done. And when it comes to the next stage, actually we deepen the knowledge of the understanding and long-term understanding what we have, previous decision, previous uh, selections and so on. And that is then the next step uh, called generative AI because we actually then have the ability to, to, for example, train large language models. These large language models can then understand human spirit, human text. So you can ask for, please show me a picture of paper towel. And then you can either search and select the Eiffel Tower, or you actually can, based on the knowledge of previous pictures that I've seen, you can try to make an Eiffel Tower itself. And that's called the generative AI, that actually can create human art, more or less, what we think is human art, pictures, coding support, help you to code things, generic, simple code structures, and so this can be done more or less automatically. Um, <coughs> Then you could discuss about the quality and who is responsible for the, the produced code. We can also use it for uh, simplify 
everyday work, for example, analyze verification works and so on, to select what is important to look at in, in the loads of data that we get out from the test runs. Um, we can also use it for authoring, uh, but this is actually bad also. We can use it for deep fake and fraud. So the crime can also use this one to emulate the appearance and, and, and what we are in perception as humans behind it. So we will be, they will be fool us, they may be even steal our money and so on. And so <clears throat> AI and the advantage and, and the improvement that we have done is giving us a lot of new features and so on. Uh, and then uh, we can also make it adaptable. That means that the AI can learn itself. Is that good or bad? And you guess, is it good or bad? It depends on the data that you actually feed into the AI. Because if you're trying to feed data with errorless data or trying to fake things like uh, faking what is the red and blue colors, in a, in a long term perspective, it actually will take the input and adopt to what we think is true or false. So that means that we get another level of what is true and false to when we are depending on the AI. Uh, I will not dig any deeper into this one, but the one that we're talking about today is a little more like deep learning than generative AI. Because we would like to use AI as a tool to simplify and, 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 and advance the decision that we need to do in every day. So, DNN and uh, this have huge potential. It actually uh, can enable us to advance forward in a faster speed than we could before. It can solve unsolvable problems, problems that we can, couldn't imagine that could be solved. Uh, it also could increase the adaptation of different applications and make them better and, and faster. And typically, a very good solution is actually for X-ray pictures and so on. The doctors would be able to have help to sort out the most suspicious uh, side of their pictures and so on, and then they can concentrate on the most important thing. But the human skills still, still need to be there because we are the ultimate decision maker and we're also the one that is responsible for this. So that means that creative AI is actually the chat GTP, the web search, and the, that is a, the head, and then there's a long tail of application where you can use it. Uh, the broad spectrum of application, typically communication, medical, air, space, IoTs, intelligent sensor, you, you just name it. So the application that we have started using today is just a small, small part of what's possible. So it's still our humans and, and we and engineers that need to tell how can we apply AI, where can we apply it, when it will it be sufficient, or when it will be sufficient to add and use other methods. So, present in AI then need to take into account a number of diverse requirements like power, performance, cost, accuracy, AI requirements, temperature ranges, and functional safety, etc., etc. So, all the appliance of today requirements need to also be placed on AI. So it's not that simple task to just move everything to AI. So typically you have embedded solution where we have we call it HII, small resources, small footprint, low power, less than 10 watt. And that's very efficient and that's actually what I normally work with uh, because I'm working uh, as a field application engineer in the automotive space. We cannot afford more than around 10 to 20 watt, for example. We also need to have very low latency, a complete electron. 
Uh, we can use it for high frequency trading, taking very quick decisions and want to be able to earn, earn money to be better than the other knowledge on the web, so we can sell and, and buy stocks in an automated way. Then we can discuss, is that good or bad? Or say, that's another question, I will not answer that one. Uh, we can also use it for high energy particle physics. For example, CERN uh, doing a lot of analysis and so on, and, and therefore you have an enormous amount of data that needs to be, so, so, to be sorted in a very short time. And therefore we need to take decisions very quickly and you need to save the data because there is not a big uh, availability of the disk and so on and, and the memory and what to save everything you need to be selected. So sustainability in over anything, energy consumption will actually be the tricky question here. When it comes to, for example, ChatGDB, ChatGDB today is using around 4.3 gigawatt hours. Gigawatt hours. When it comes to meta AI cluster, they consume to 53 to 561 terawatt hours. And that means that uh, the total energy consumption of Ireland is 26 terawatt hours. And Germany is 537 terawatt hours. Is this sustainable? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> More, uh, build more power, nuclear power plants, maybe. But with the solution today, it's not sustainable. We need to get away from this sledgehammer approach. We need to make AI more efficient. We cannot use hundreds of kilos of uh, matrix multiplication. Compare this to the human brain capabilities. It's an estimated difference of 10 by the power of 5 in more efficiency in our human brains, as we are typically consuming around 20 watts in the normal thinking and doing. So, the conclusion of this one we cannot just add more air, we cannot just add more power, we cannot add just more set channel. We actually need to think why, how, and, uh, and in a, what way we should implement AI to make it more efficient. For example, in a car, uh, I think a normal issue will not be able to uh, consume more than around 30 watt as maximum. And then we add around 100 issues, then we have already there an unsustainable solution because you produce, you will consume all the power on the ECUs where you like to use the power for driving your car forward for electrical cars. So you need to find the sweet spot, the trade-off here. And how to approach to get this sweet spot and how to get this solution that is uh, that is actually efficient enough. So it started, in this slide, started around uh, 2014 and so on. A basic implementation, we scaled up and we scaled out and, uh, and so on. And at the end here we actually see that sustainable AI need to improve uh, the er er energy efficiency. Because we can't just carry on making more and faster and uh, as well. We can grow in this direction. The other way around, normal engineering to make things more efficient, thinking about things, developing things, implementing things in, an, uh, in a more efficient way, uh, testing and applying software, verifying and then roll out. This is typically a waterfall method, might not be the one that you're using in software because we are more agile. But <clears throat> if you go back in, in the traditional industry, you'll see that many one is still using this one, especially for hardware. That means that you need to do all these steps and so on. 
and it will take you 18 plus 18 when that one. And that is far too slow. And the reason why we're doing this one would like to be more efficient. But the innovation speed is faster. And that means that we actually need to find a way to make the matching the implementation decisions with the innovation speed that is needed to be able to get energy efficient implementation. So, before we carry on with these details, why didn't it work out? So typically here, <clears throat> we need to make efficient implementation and make efficient implementation about decision of making hardware and software more efficient. We also need to be agile in to be able to support this dynamic uh, and diverse uh, and the faster round, round times. And the purpose of this one is all actually to get a solution from an engineering point of perspective, that is more if energy efficient. So, agility, agility is the king uh, here in the, for, for the customization, but we need to automate this process. But before we are looking into how to do things, I would like to step back once again. Previously in my presentation, as I said that uh, AI is not just a life transfer function. It's a transfer function with maybe memory in internal state. But if it's a transfer function, you can actually treat it as single processing. So that means that if you look at this one, this is an application of maybe a, a camera sensor. So a camera sensor input, system pre-processing, algorithm pre-processing, then in the, the purple in the middle you actually have the AI solution, then you need to have some algorithmic pre-processing, uh, post-processing and system post-processing to take the action of the decision that is taken by the AI. So this is typically <coughs> just a transfer function, step by step. Uh, it could be for example, normalization, post-processing, color-code space conversion, presenting things for the humans and so on. We can also look at this in this way. As, uh, this is data, capture of the data, prepare the data, single processing, arrange, distribute and the data goes. Typically, you have uh, the operators, data types. Uh, the data flow can either be reducing that means that you take a lot of data to take a decision, yes, this is a cat. Or you actually take the data uh, and then transform it to something else, typically FFT. You take time domain and get frequency data in and out. That means that the same amount of data in and out. Uh, then you can also produce more data. Normally not good, but you can do it. But all of this one is important, as it's called about time budget. How much time do you have to produce a present? <coughs> in every day, you can take a coffee, coffee is taking too long time, maybe. But in reality, if this one is an automated ADA system inside the car, you like to take a decision before you are colliding with the car in front of you. That means that to be around 20 to 100 milliseconds. So, these time markets actually to do the processing is one of the most vital things. That is what we have mentioned as uh, latency. But then you can apply some kind of algorithm in this signal processing. It can be linear algorithm, it can be convolution, or transformation, as I said earlier, as well, the FFT. So, one to one mapping AI is nothing else than just transforming. Maybe with internal state, or maybe with larger memory. So, when it comes to processing time budget, actually it depends on where you are, how you are, and what you like to do. 
So for example, if you like to use AI in wireless radio and wireless baseband and so on, then you have around one microseconds or less. Uh, it depends on. When it comes to automotive ADAS, you're in the domain of uh, a couple of microseconds, 10 to a couple of milliseconds. When it comes to video and image and so on, then you like to be able to process the previous picture frame until the next picture frame will be there. Otherwise, the latency will be too large. Um, and I also would like to take this into account that if the data result is not delivered in time, it's in ADAS application, you will collide, people will die. If you have radar applications and so on like that to save you against the missiles as well, in the, like in, in Israel, the Iron Dome, if they don't detect and shoot it down, then it will be, be people who are dying from the explosions. So, important here, we need to process in time, not only energy efficient, if you're using this form of AI, we also need to make it in time. So, what is then typically the difference between normal processing and, and AI? So, we can take this application, for example. Uh, the application on the left here is actually computer vision based. So that means that we will have a camera and we will identify objects. These objects uh, will be framed so we know that this is to be pedestrians in the upper corner. It could also be that we are taking a lot of input data from cameras and stitching them together and so on and allowing you to have a surround view when you are parking your car in our spaces to help you to park the, the, the car. But if you're using an AI to park the car, if you're using an AI to select the object, if you're using an AI to make the decisions and so on, we don't need to do a lot of pre-processing because the original frame can just then be added with this information and taken this perception knowledge and so on into, uh, into, uh, into account. And for example, if you look at the surrounding there, we don't need to change the fish island systems and do, doing this uh, uh, transformation and so on for your visibility. We can actually let AI directly correlate the different objects and so on and understand the distance to the potential cars that you shouldn't park into. So AI will allow us to remove a lot of unnecessary processing. It is just to take decisions. But if you then also need to present it for humans, Maybe a, a picture like the sound room is a nice to look at instead of these fish lenses. When it comes to a, a, ADAS and AI, I'll take this as an example because I'm working with it. Uh, you do it for classification, detection, and segmentation. And there is a lot of implemented, implemented uh, algorithm today, that is more or less nets that have a certain kind of ability and, 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 uh, and knowledge built into them, more or less. So, these models is very often used using an open AI model support. And then the question, why are we using an open AI model support? Because the innovation speed is far much faster if you are more people doing the same thing and sharing your innovation and your knowledge that you achieve. Then the actual implementation of this one and tuning it to be energy efficient, tuning it to be very low latency and so on, that would be proprietary for the company and giving them an opportunity to sell the company. And, uh, and the software. So enabling rapid specialization, because specialization was the key to be able to reduce the power consumption. So if you want to enable this rapid spe 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 specialization, we actually need to uh, take the AI stack, customize the hardware, 
and then adapt the computer fabric to be more efficient implementation. And there, I would say, FPGA is an excellent candidate because it is per definition, per persona, changeable. Not only the software, but also the hardware is changeable, down to the minimum smallest components. So, and these features that we are supplying in this presentation, that is also supplied as a link later on as open source, is Bevitas and Finn. Bevitas is the training network capabilities, and Finn is the implementation solution for this one. Uh, I all, always get questions at the end of the presentation. Uh, can we use either other FPGAs and Sargonics and AMD? Yes, because of open source. Actually, you need to do the implementation steps as well from their closed source software as well. But otherwise, the first step as well, this is generic. So, before we are stepping down to actually how we implement things, I would like to go back and look at how is actually a CNN network implemented in our any one of you have implemented that one in hardware? I know Derek Katz, so he's not on, he, he cannot answer. So typically, <coughs> you have a number of layers in the implementation structures, convolutions, then pooling, then other convolution, then pooling, and then fully connection, and at the end you have a number of predicted output uh, selections. And this, this example we have, Selection bin of dead dog, cat, boat, and bird. That is what we are finding with this network. And then we have a certain kind of probability. The picture that we are looking at the moment is that a bird, cat, dog, or a boat. And for some reason I see that 94% the probability is actually is a boat. And yes, it's obviously a boat, uh, but uh, how to get there? So typically, the number of steps that you take, you can look at this one frequency component uh, and so on. So your sub-sections, the low-level features, mid-level features, the high-level features, and then trainable classifier at the end. And typically the image is then convolved uh, with the future. You can look at them from a mathematical point of perspective, or more reasonable for people like me and Derek, we are looking at how to implement this in hardware. And that will then be typically uh, matrix multiplication addition and then bias officer and then at the end some kind of <coughs> activation function and so on. So all this voodoo about AI is down to mathematics. All this voodoo about AI is actually down to transfer functions. So it isn't that complex, but the complexity will then also be handled by we need to sample the input features, tensors, we need to have the weight, we need to have the output tensors, we need to store things as well. And the more things that we need to store intermediate, the more things that we are doing in sequence that means that we store need to store more memory in larger depths and so on, is actually a complicating factor because it produces power consumption. And power consumption is not our friend here. So, just to give you a brief understanding of what an FPGA is. FPGA is, like software, is changeable and updatable and so on, and you can make a lot of constructions. FPGA have basic primitives that is actually updatable. So the basic function of an FPGA is, is, is a lookup table. The, Transfer functions, input pins, output pins, lookup table, equation. Apart from that one, we also have memory. Um, but the important thing here was that this hardware can actually be tuned to do a certain kind of function. Uh, so to improve this one, we also have a set of uh, programmable lookup tables, millions of them, programmable interconnect. And yes, interconnect was important because how to connect things together? and who is the seeing what of the different functions. The next section is programmable by uh, DSP block, uh, multiple accumulated functionalities, 
and also memory, embedded internal memory. So, FGA is flexible, but apart from that one, we see that FGA is e efficient and good to do in transfer functions, but sometimes we actually need to accelerate those transfer functions to be even more energy efficient, energy efficient. And then typically, in that case, we have a certain kind of processing that the things that's the important run. If you know about NVIDIA, for example, they are running their AI on uh, GPU elements and so on. We can also, in AMD, racing uh, and, um, and the radio uh, processors, and we also have GPU acceleration function. You can run it that either in the processor or in the uh, graphical unit, but you can also use it in dedicated elements, uh, AI engines, or AMD refer to call it XDNA, as they have uh, RDNA and, uh, and so on. Uh, but nevertheless, it is just dedicated, very large instruction sets process with a lot of connectivity and also an automated DMA functionality that handles things. There is also a scaling process that, that control, control things. Uh, and there is loads of them. And they also connect it to memory. These can be working as one big solution into memory and over time. They can be used as separate implementation blocks and they also can be cascaded in the stream solution. Stream solution is one output into next block, into the next block and so on. Automatic transfer by clock cycles. <clears throat> so, then typically how they are implemented in those components. Very much the same actually. What you need to do is actually need to tell where is the compute of the layers, where is the memory located in the layers. So typically if you have an AI engine and array structure, you need to tell which of these AI engines is implementing the layer one? Which is implementing layer two? Which have in the storage of the components? Which have the intermediate data result? Which have the output results and so on? So it's a balancing on where to think, locate things in the processing sections and the memory sections and so on. And balance those that one say would be efficient. And believe me, uh, Derek is doing his work every day on that one, balancing this one, especially for wireless application because they have the shortest time to implementation. So, then the next step here is actually when we talk about data flow. Uh, data flow itself is important here because if you are not utilizing the data flow in a good way, you need to use memory storage in between. And all the memory storage in between the land consume a lot of power. So the power consumption is actually one of the critical things here. And memory is one of the, of the, the one that actually consumes the most. Not only the memory itself, but actually to transfer to and from. Because it's running in high speed and a lot of bits. So data for itself. If you look at their single implementation function like A, B, and C, and D, they can work in in parallel or time sharing on the CPU. Uh, if you allocate them into a certain kind of block here, you can talk, talk about 1K locks here, for example. You have 1K inference per second, so that's only for implement this 1K lot. If you have 10K lock, yeah, then you can have 1 mega, infer mega, uh, mega inference per second. And if you have 1 million of locks, then you might be able to use 100 mega inference per second. So the scalability comes with the available resources. If the data flow is due, otherwise you need to share memory in between, and then the performance will not scale linear as this. So the next step that is important when it gets more efficient and efficient is quantization. So customizing arithmetics in a minimal position is very important. So, if you start working with your algorithms on what is the 
data type that you're using. Integer? Float. Float. Integer float might be good. For AI, integer float is far much overhead. Far much overhead. Because if you look at integer 32 bit here, compared to 8 bit and compared to even 1 bit, then there is enormous difference in how many locations in memory you are using, how much bandwidth you are using on the bus, how much energy you are using. So that means energy is actually directly scaled to the number of bits that you are using over time. So if you can avoid storing data, that is unnecessary. Don't do it. So that's one of the reasons why we are put the effort on conversation. Will that be good enough? Will that be good enough? Actually, we have an application note here from science where we have used low precision perception. We use it for 3D detection camera and uh, visualization of segmentation and multitask learning and so on. We can actually see that the difference between quality of the output of using 4-bit or using 8-bit is not that big. So that means that if it's good enough to use 4-bit, then we have saved 50% of the power doing the same thing. And also, smaller implementation, even there it will save power. And less latency maybe. So that means that there is a lot of things that you can gain by adding uh, conservation steps. And the last thing I'm going to talk about here really before we are summarizing things up, where we are getting the results and so on, is first. So typically, when you're starting with the network here, every layer, every synapse, emulated synapse and so on, will contribute. But when it comes to a train network and so on, you can see that actually based on activation function, based on uh, uh, weight factors and so on, they are not contributing at all. They are getting output results of zero. Why actually have something in the network that doesn't contribute to the result? So, if you start looking at pruning and removing nodes that actually doesn't really give us any improvement of the result, then we can also save power, we can say logic, and then we can also save latency maybe. So that means that the massive scope of ambulance one, we can actually then take the usage and understanding and we can test the same improved network with the same input data and see that yes, the quality is good enough. Because everything that we are doing is changing quantization, changing uh, sparsity, and so on, need to be tested and make sure that the quality is good enough. So, typically, sparsity also gives us the ability that we have another FPD implementation that not, might not be optimized. So, therefore, we can actually take another step of re optimizing the structure, making it more streamlined in the implementation. Maybe also reducing the latency and uh, complexity. Spurge did an extreme code design and the actually thin network can actually be implemented in the smallest, simple, logical lookup tables. Lots. So let us say that we have an application here that every node here will be implemented in 16 input lot. Uh, then we can do this training with this fin uh, lock that we actually call Loginets. This is one bit notation, one bit implementation mapping directly into the primitives of the circuit. Uh, so, how do we get them? So, typically, we are using Bevita's training tool to, to, to take the input factors and so on. And it's not only generating then the normal uh, training for the nodes, it also takes into account that defining what is the concession that's needed. It also takes into account, uh, into account what possible elements should be implemented as, as this step, in the fifth step. And actually taking the awareness of a library 
of kernel nodes or implementation, subbox or Linux for AI. You can call it Linux for AI. So the components together with this kernel libraries and so on, we have put this as an open source. That means that every uh, user he can collaborate with, uh, with his customers and with us also. Third party part, uh, party contribution is very welcome. You might be smarter than us, so why not taking your knowledge into account as well? So the Brevitas, the PyTorch library here, will then retrain awareness of the conversation, retrain the collaboration based upon the conversation and also data free of conversation. And then we have uh, conversation layers, building blocks, and exporting this one to the first two chain. It could be used for film, but it also could be used for other networks. That means that we are not locking this one to be only film. It's actually up to you. Uh, the film, I'll jump pretty fast forward here. Uh, I think I might do the C++ description. So it would be like a less stream, input, output. Uh, instantiating these building blocks and so on. So it's a human available code that is output for this one. You can actually look at this one and try to understand it. And long term perspective, it actually would be harder implementing certain kind of flow. And uh, then it creates this DNN hardware IP and so on and makes it thank things that you can simulate, implement, and utilize in hardware. Some example result here, you can see that they actually give you an issue uh, efficient is quite improved when you go from int 4 to int 2, um, uh, an enormous improvement. Also, an improvement in the conversation. So, first of all, you have improvement of uh, the number of bits located in conversations. You also need to have uh, the code itself. And this one is actually adding together as factors. So that all of this one is actually helping you to save power in the long-term perspective. So significant initiation will be by pruning and conservation of the model. Uh, this is another example here. We can actually improve this one from 8-bit DPU function down to 2-bit integrated fin. is a improvement factor of 1272. Then we can further improve this one with another factor of 3.6 if you go to one bit implementation. So there is a lot of things that can be gained by if you add in these skills and knowledge as well into your design. Uh, this is an example of how to implement this one with uh, uh, cybersecurity in very low uh, latency and very low efficiency. And that is actually needed if you like to save your uh, gateway functionality to Due to frauds and so on. Uh, I think that is very efficient implementation. So 92% accuracy with very small implementation. Um, there is also a logic that the implementation here from CERN that gives you uh, 666 mega inference per second and latency 3 nanoseconds. 3 nanoseconds. And the resources we're using is 30 lots. 30 lots. That's like a hardware to implement a full ladder. Of course, we have dedicated resources as this full ladder inside FJ, but it is actually the size of it. So, this will then summarize up uh, this one. Uh, the slides will be available on the net later on, so you can actually look at the figures and details later on. Uh, I will say it's impossible to implement this one in communication because the uh, sensory intelligence and so on. And it's an open source adaptation here. You have the links to the GitHubs here, uh, both for Finn and for Gravitas. So the summary, pervasive AI will take into account the dynamic and diverse of the long tail of their AI application paradigm will shift to energy efficient. Uh, it will be enabling you specific 
architectures, because specific architect is generated out of the other structure here. So Pivitas and Finn will actually give you implementation that is adaptable to be more efficient. So based upon your findings of the results of your models and so on, you can then, for example, put quantization and lower the, the cost in power consumption. Uh, adaptive computing uh, is available with a great, great diversity of data flow, shrinking, shrinking with persistence and, and have fine grain neural and you can speed up the automation of this one. So this is typically the, the, my message as well. So I will say that keep in mind that just using AI must not be the answer. You also need to think and take the decision by yourself. What is needed and how is needed. So not only why and what, but also how to implement things and so on. And the engineers are still needed to do this work. You are the one that can judge whether it's good or bad. I would say small is good, low latency is good, low memory is good, of course. But there is an effort to get there. So you need to have an application that actually needs this effort, maybe. But in most cases, I will say, it's worth the effort. In that case, thank you very much. Thank you. I think we have time for one or two questions. Is there anyone? Um, so I wanted to ask in one of your earlier slides, the one that had the Tesla bots, um, you, uh, you you had a, a, a text that said um, that uh, they would, uh, there's less need for domain expertise or something like that. So what, what could, could you please elaborate what you meant by that? Because in my experience when I use AI, or LLMs in particular, I find them um, super useful when I have the domain expertise, but not very useful where, when I'm not a domain expert in whatever I'm trying to do with them. Uh, so, yeah, what, what, what did you mean by that? That you have me relatively little domain expertise? Do you have any? I think Derek is, uh, is, is the best one to answer that question. So. Yeah, so, I think uh, you're partly right. If you have the domain expertise, of course, you see the, the, the solutions that they have for them also. But there are things that you may not foresee, even though you are experienced, you may find some synapses 
are activated on features that you can't easily identify. So if you take the image example for this as a case study, we used to interpret that by patterns, pattern recognition. That's how the human brain is working. It's very good at identifying anomalies in, in patterns, but there may be some hidden features that we're not directly linking with our minds. So with that, we can find more um, artifacts or features that help us uh, identify the system. The same with the uh, image processing. If you do look at it from creating an image that we can interpret, you can also think from the whole system perspective. From acquiring the data for the image already uh, at the AD conversion, we are adding a lot of information to make it visually appealing before we actually use the picture. So what if we cut some steps there and, and try to uh, find the features already on the raw data instead? Does that satisfy the question? Yeah. And what else? I'll have to cut off the discussion unfortunately, but I'm sure it will just continue in the foyer. So thank you again, Trigger. Thanks. Thanks.